A new study conducted by the People's Policy Project seeks to pinpoint economic inequality across age, class, and racial lines. And one of its most astonishing findings is that the top percent of wealth in our country is owned by an increasingly older population, specifically people over the age of 50, and distributed very unevenly almost within every single subgroup. Joining us to discuss the results of that recent study is president of the People's Policy Project, Matt Burnin. Great to have you, Matt. Good to see you, Matt. Thanks for having me. Mm -hmm. Just tell us a little bit, top line, what did you find overall about the distribution of wealth in this country? So overall, the top 10% of uh, American families own about 75% of the wealth. Um, uh, uh, maybe a somewhat more conversational way to put it is people who have a million dollars or more, they own right about 80% of all the wealth in the country. Wow. The bottom half of Americans own 1.5%. And so you have a little group in between that owns a little bit of wealth. Um, but that's basically what you have. The top owns almost all of it, and the bottom owns very, very little of it. And this holds across pretty much every group you can imagine. So there are differences, of course. Older people are wealthier than younger people on average. Uh, white people are wealthier than black people on average. People with college degrees are wealthier than people with high school degrees on average. But when you look at each one of those groups, you see the exact same inequality. So, you know, the top 10% of elderly people own 75% of the wealth. The top 10% of white people own 75% of the white wealth. So it's really the same story over and over again in every single group. Yeah, it's crazy to me, Matt. I mean, I've started thinking about it. Like wealth gaps, as we think of them, are really just like competitions between which top 10 percent of which groups own the majority of the wealth. So whenever we see this, first of all, what kind of myths about economic policy does this, dis does this basically disprove? And what are some of the things that we should be thinking about in response to this if we want to achieve a more equitable society? Yeah, so <clears throat> there are a lot of myths. So one is that you know wealth inequality is just a function of age. When you're young, you're just out of college, you maybe you have some student debt, or if you didn't go to college, you still don't have anything that you've built up yet, but you get older and you get wealthier, you save money, et cetera, et cetera. And while that's true for the, say, top 10%, it's less true for, say, the middle or bottom half of elderly people. You know, So uh, individuals over the age of 65 who are in the bottom half of 65-year-olds and over, they own, you know, one, two, three percent of the wealth of that group. Right. And the same thing holds over and over again. And like you said, um, you know, when we talk about racial gaps or we talk about educational gaps, we're really talking about the gaps between the top people in each of those uh, groups. So, I mean, one one kind of eye popping stat that you could use to uh, indicate this is the gap between Jeff Bezos and the wealthiest um, black billionaires. I don't know, it's something like $150 billion. I don't remember the number straight off the top of my head, but you know, it's, it's a very big gap. But that, um, that amount, that's pretty much the gap between the bottom half of white people and bottom half of black people combined. Right? So like just the gap between the wealthiest white and black person is the whole gap between the bottom half. Um, so that's really where the action is, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's fascinating. Talk a little bit about what you found with regards to education. You described it as like we have an educated upper class and a mixed lower class. And the same dynamic basically plays out. Yes, college educated people overall do much better than high school educated people economically have much higher wealth um, amount of wealth. But even within that group of college educated people, it's like the top 10 percent who hold, hold overwhelmingly um, the vast bulk of the wealth. Right. Yes. The, so, for example, the bottom 30 percent of people with a college degree have no net worth on average. They have, they have nothing. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, this is like you said, the dynamic over and over again. I think it's important for political reasons to understand this. Like it's very all well and good to say, hey, on average, people with college degrees do better than people without or on average, white people do better than black people. And, and these are important things for all sorts of policy reasons. But it's important not to then conclude from that that so the bottom half just consists of young people, people of color, and uh, high school dropouts. No, the bottom half has it all. The bottom half has a lot of elderly people in it. Over a third of people in the bottom half uh, of the overall distribution are over the age of 50. You know, over half of people in the bottom half are white. Uh, you know, you can go on and on. So the bottom half is a very, very, very mixed group. Um, 
Yeah, and Matt, so think about, let's, let's talk about this. I have this argument with people all the time. What, in your view, is the clearest delineator of class in America? Education? Is it, you know, wealth, race, class? Like, how do you think about it? How should we think about class lines in the United States? Yeah, you know, that's a tough question. There are sociological classes. There are, you know, income classes, wealth classes, consumption classes, uh, you know, some people make low incomes, but they're in prestigious jobs. Uh, you know, the way that they try to, uh, I don't know, split the baby in sociology is they will create an index that includes your education, includes your income, includes what kind of job you have, includes what kind of wealth you have. They throw all that into a kind of complicated formula and it, it gives you a, a single number at the end of it. And then they can kind of cut it up and say you're in the bottom third of class, the middle mm -hmm. third of class or whatever. That, you know, maybe fits kind of our social sense of it. Um, but for me, you know, I don't know, based on the way I think about the economy, I really think about wealth first and foremost. And Matt, finally, the study looks at um, all of these numbers are based on 2019 data. Um, how do you think that they've changed in 2020 as a result of the pandemic? You know, uh, I, I, so at, at the beginning of 2020, probably inequality fell quite a bit because the stock market took a big, big dive. But now the stock market's back. Um, the real estate market didn't really seem to take much of a dive at all. If anything, it seemed to tick up a little bit. Those are the two big asset classes, right? Uh, real property and stocks. And the values, the prices of those dipped, but then they came back. And so I, you know, I would bet it's pretty much what it was in 2019 at this point. Yeah. Well. There you go. Fascinating Matt. dynamics. Thank you yeah. so much, Matt. Great to have you. Thank you. Thanks. Next on Rising, Dr. Abdul Al Sayed. He's going to discuss the conflicting reports on Trump's hospitalization and his coronavirus diagnosis. That is when Rising returns. <laughs>